Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's meeting, this week's Monday meeting on Labor Day of 2014. As we come into... 2024. Yeah, you're right, 2024. <laughs> my, my mind is all over the place these days. Yeah, my, mine usually is, so you can be forgiven for sure. So as we as we begin our study, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance as we open his word and that of his prophet in prayer. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for all of the blessings that you are providing. We thank you for all of the opportunities we have to learn more about you, to be guided by you, so that we might draw closer to you. We ask, Father, for your blessing and your guidance. For those that are not here today, we ask as well for your blessing upon us. As we open your word, show us, Father, that which we should do. Help us so that that which is done may bring glory to your name. May your angels be with us. May your spirit direct us. We thank you for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We invite you, we invite the spirit to join with us today so that we might better understand that which we might see. Help us to this end. For this we thank you, for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's a reason that I brought up a a spreadsheet. So as we are going to be addressing several points, we're going to look to, to place some items on a line. Now, we are all familiar with Daniel 9 especially the last portion of Daniel 9. But have any of us ever really taken the time to draw this out onto a line and to examine exactly how this would look? Now, the reason that I'm asking these questions, as we've gone over the last several articles that we have been examining, I look at these and I'm, I'm trying to understand the thinking of the author, and how we can relate these to the way that that we've related everything else. So I was asking that we take a look at some of these things to see if the way that I have explained things in the past have been clear. So as I was saying this last week, I, I was asking you to become my jury. Because if I'm not clear, I would like you to tell me. So as we're going to look at this, we're going to have the need to open Daniel 9 as a beginning. Because the understanding of Daniel 9 can help us solidify our understanding of Daniel 8. Would you agree? Do I? Can you repeat the question? Okay. I was asking the question, if our understanding of Daniel 9, especially the last verses of Daniel 9, if this would help us understand or would would help clarify our understanding of Daniel 8, especially from verses 13 and 14 and onward. Would you agree with that? Sure. Okay. Now, as we would look at... Scripture. When we when we open the book of Daniel and we come to Daniel 9, we would come to the portion here at Daniel 9, verse 20. And as Daniel writes, and whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, had caused to fly, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, here's Daniel. He is speaking and he is telling us that Gabriel was told to fly swiftly and that Gabriel was there when he is being told to seal up the vision, the calzone, and prophecy. And is there to anoint, and this vision is to to help us to understand when they're going to anoint the most holy. Now, 
Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, if this is correct, and I would, I would have to think that it is correct, we would be able to look at it in this way. So we've looked and we've drawn lines to the past. Here, we wind up with this line beginning. Now, if we're understanding this correctly, we would have a period kind of like this. So in this point, we could look at this and call this the 70 weeks. I know this is kind of hard to see. I apologize for that. We'll change some things in a moment. Now, what does the verse first state as we're as we're looking at this so yea while i was was speaking in prayer even the man gabriel whom i've seen at the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation and he informed me and talked with me and said oh daniel i am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding At the beginning of thy supplication, the commandment came forth, and I am come to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. So Daniel 9.23 is telling Daniel to consider the vision. Now, is this the same vision that we were speaking of in the first part of this section? Is this the calzone vision? that Gabriel references in, in verse 921. What do you think? I think it's part of it, 70 years, right? 400, uh, 70 weeks, 490 years. Okay, but He's here, be talking about. Let's, that's part of the 2600. Okay, let's, let's look at this in greater detail. In Daniel 921, we have, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the vision in the calzone at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Yet here in Daniel 9.24, excuse me, in Daniel 9.23, we are told, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved, Therefore, understand the matter, understand the debar, and consider the mare. Understand what you stated and what I told you in Daniel 8, 26. Understand that, as I said in 8, 26, and the vision of the evening, morning, which was told is true. So is Daniel being reminded that he has seen Gabriel in the calzone? Brother Dwight. Yes. I probably should know this, but I'm going to ask you. Therefore, understand the matter. You said the bar. Yes. Where did you get the bar from? When you're looking at this, when I, when I am looking at Daniel 9.23, and I look at the various words that are used in that particular passage. Right. If I'm using my, as a, the, the tool I use the most right now is eSword. Right. And if I'm looking at the King James with the different Hebrew numbers incorporated, the Debar, the Matter, is Hebrew 1697. So I got, I got the debar from the. Understand the matter. That's where you got the debar from. Right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. All right. Good deal. Okay. So in other words, Daniel's being told to consider what we've talked about. He's to understand what we've talked about. And now he's to consider something else. He is to consider the mare. He is to consider the vision of the evening morning. He is to consider 
the vision that is true. Now, in comparing these two verses, does this allow us to see that this prophecy of 70 weeks is part of the vision of the evening morning, or what we call the 2300 days of Daniel 8? Can we agree with that? Yes. Okay. Amen. Okay. Okay, so if we can agree with this, then as we are going through this portion from Daniel 9.24 forward, we are receiving a prophecy that says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in ever everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. So the sealing of the calzone should be done within the 70 weeks. Would we agree with that? Does it make sense? Do we have a problem? Can we agree that in this time period, in this 70 weeks, we can see that a period of judgment a period of examination of the people of God, of the children of Israel, is going to occur. Yes. Okay. Now, in this situation, we now have a, a breakdown where we have, when we are, are walking through this portion, the following verse says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now we've made a division within this figure. And I know that the figure is not as easy to see as, as some. But here we would have seven weeks. Here we would have three score and two weeks. And how many weeks is three score and two? 62. Okay. 62 weeks. Now, in the verse before, we are told that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. So if we have seven weeks and we have 62 weeks, how many weeks is that total? So we have 69, 69 weeks. Right? So in this portion, in this final portion here, how many weeks are there going to be in this final portion? One, in it? Correct. So in our situation here, in this line, we have a breakdown. Seven weeks, seven weeks of days, we would, and, and we can see expressed as express it in this way, we would show it seven weeks of days would be seven times seven, and seven times seven is 49, ain't it? Correct, and gives us 49. For some reason, my, my uh, number pad isn't working the way I'd like it to. Now, on the other hand, here we would have a period of 62 times seven, but if we're dealing with this mathematically again, we would have a time period of 434 years. Now, here we have a single week. So we would have a total of seven years. Now, when we would add all of this up, we would have a period of 490 years. So mathematically, can we prove this portion of the book of Daniel? Do the numbers work out? So here. We will try to make this work this way. Does that look right? 49 plus 434 plus 7 equals 490, right? Okay. Now, as we're dealing with this, we now have broken down the prophetic word to show that these 490 years, this portion of Daniel mathematically can be proven. Now, Daniel 9.26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, 
and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Daniel 9.27, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination, she shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So this little picture that's here, this little diagram, shows us the 70 weeks, shows us this 49-year period first, a 434 period next, and one week at the end. Now, does this allow us to look to affix this prophecy with a starting point and an ending point? Because what begins this prophecy? When is Daniel told this prophecy is going to begin? When uh, when the decree goes forth. When the decree goes forth. And when have we accepted that when the decree goes forth? 457 B.C. Right. Now, it's interesting to me because as I went through and I was doing reading, I was able to obtain a copy of the 1919 Bible Conference and the transcript of the conversations that went on there. Now, 1919 was four years after the death of Ellen White. By 1919, the person that was being adjudged as the best teacher of these situations in the Bible, W.W. Prescott, he came to this conference and he made it very clear that, number one, he hoped to never again have to give a sermon on the 2300 days. He just never wanted to touch on it again. But the thing that was most interesting from this was that he's also made the comment that he did not believe that 538 was a valid date and that 538 AD should have been noted as occurring about 200 years later. Now, if you take away the 2300 days, aren't you, aren't you also discounting this 490-year period? that begins the 2300 days. You also deny the 2520. Right down the line. Yes, I agree. Now, there are others, Desmond Ford as being one, that stated, that taught, that stood, that the 2300 days prophecy was a literal prophecy, that it was 2300 days days because his attitude and his comment was that the hebrew does not support the prophetic understanding now for what we're looking at here <clears throat> when we break this down in the way that we're doing right now if we were to affix here the year 457 bc for this to be truly 490 years this would end in 34 AD. Do we understand that? And do we understand how this, how we, how we make this work? Okay. In the chat, it's yes. Now to cover this so that we would understand it best, we would do this. And I'm, I'm going to write this out mathematically. We would take this. We would take our 457 date from this. We would subtract one, but then we would add our ending date. Now, the reason we would subtract one is because we're making the change from B.C. to A.D. And mathematically, we still have 490 or 77s, 490 years for this time period. Now, if the 2300 days can be affixed in this way, if this portion these 70 weeks can be addressed in this way, does this cement and properly affix this 
portion of the 2300 evening morning prophecy in time. Okay, now the comment here. Hang on. Okay, what you're saying here is, it would be very worthwhile to watch the video of Herbert Douglas on the 1919 Bible Conference and the revisionists involved who capitulated to Calvinist evangelicals and pushed with aid from the Much in Debt Review and Herald Association to produce Question on Doctrine. Kelly posted it 2520 Facebook and it's on YouTube. Herbert Douglas quotes W.W. W. Prescott and others and defends Ellen White and basic SDAism. Okay, so when we're going through this right now, and I'm going back to a, a diagram that I shared last year in the Canadian camp meeting, we would have the third decree beginning in 457 BC. This would place us with the seventh week as occurring in 408 BC. It would put 434 years in the center. And then at the very end, we would have this week from 27 AD to 34 AD. Now, does this make sense? Is this in agreement with what we were just addressing? Does this look right? Yeah, I think that would be the standard understanding. Okay. But if this is our standard understanding, why is it so difficult when we are confronted by other Adventists as well as other Protestants that have a difficulty with this understanding? I mean, the, the whole point that Desmond Ford was making was that this portion, this prophecy, 2,300 evening morning with 490 of these evening morning, that this was literal and not figurative. And then when Ford attempts to place this, he doesn't use the, the third decree. He's going far into the time period of the decree. Now, when we are taking this directly, when we are solidifying our understanding of this time, of this prophecy, we should be able to affix the understanding by using history. Isn't that the way that Father Miller came to understand many of the prophecies that he found in the Bible? Yes, I believe that is. But as Desmond Ford, does he actually say that 70 weeks is also uh, a literal thing, or is it just 2,300 days? Okay. So I'm just I'm just asking that question. I'm just uh, maybe misheard you. I thought I don't understand that. Uh, I'm not too clear whether what you're saying there. Well, what what I'm trying to say is that when De what Desmond Ford was trying to to present, and what he did present at Glacier View, was that Miller was wrong in his understanding of this period being prophetic. Ford wanted to present this strictly as being a literal time frame. And part of my part of my purpose for presenting and re going back over what we had addressed at the camp meeting was to look first at our understanding and then take a look at what Ford's understanding had been, because Ford's understanding is very much in line with what all of the Protestants are currently understanding. Here again, if we're not understanding the seven times of Leviticus 26, if we're setting that aside, then our situation becomes one that, that we become very much adrift because the seven times helps us to understand the prophetic periods and link them to history, where without it, we're very much like a ship without an anchor. We can drift anywhere. Now, did I answer your question? Um, so what I was asking was concerning the 2,800 days yeah. and the 70 weeks. So um, Desmond Ford, he understood that the 70 weeks. Now he would have took you to the time of Christ's ticket. I don't think he was applying that literal. Would that be correct? 
It's just the 2,300 days that he's taking literal. Correct. He's taking the 2,300 days literal. But as we were as we were addressing at the beginning of the meeting, from the verses that, that we read in the book of Daniel, at verse 921, we established that Daniel says, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, the calzone at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Now, by verse 23, Gabriel is speaking and says to Daniel, At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter, understand the debar, and consider the mare. Consider the vision that is true consider the 2300 so the point that i was making is it clear that daniel recognizes that gabriel was there when he is trying to come to the understanding of the big picture the calzone but here in daniel 9 he's being told to consider the 2300 the vision of the evening and morning, the vision which is true. And he's linking this with the 490. He's not separating it. He is he's incorporating it. Ford does try to separate these visions. He's trying to put the entire 2300 before this, especially before the final week. Ford attempts to place all of this occurring within the time frame of Antiochus Epiphanes, where I have a problem with that, and I'm willing to be corrected, is first, this portion of the vision is to take place subsequent to the third decree. Second, this portion of this vision is to include those that would stand against the Messiah. Now, the pioneers came to an understanding. How could Antiochus Epiphanes in any manner stood against the Messiah, being that he died over 160 years before the birth of the Messiah? So this was an old point. This was an old issue of that time. And we're seeing this yet today. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I understand. Okay. So throughout, if we are studying line upon line, if we are studying without the commentary of other men, these <clears throat> type of understandings can become more clear. Yes, we have to wrestle with it. Yes, we have to battle with this. But throughout, we're able to take this step by step to consider what was going on. Now, here again, W.W. Prescott, by 1919, wanted to remove specific pins and waymarks of the pioneers. He didn't like 538 A.D. He believed that that was misstated and should have been stated as occurring a couple of hundred years later. Now, what does 538 A.D. do for us? What, what is the, the reason that we have 538 A.D. on the charts right now and since 1843? What is its significance? Well, it marks the beginning of, of 160 years of papal supremacy. Right. Now, the comment has been made in the past that 508 is on the charts. Because if we if we look at this, 508 followed by 538, we would look at this as being the time when, in 508, paganism begins to be taken, is being set aside. And 30 years later, we have papalism coming to the forefront. Without 538, we would have no placement then for 1260 years. 
for that portion, that 42-month period that would bring us to the time of the end, right? So Prescott, in wanting to move this 200 years further, instead of having the time of the end be in 1798 when the Pope is taken captive, he would want it to be in 1998. Now, when I consider that, and when I saw that and did my examination, began again going through the 1919 Bible conference transcripts, all I could do is shake my head. Did Prescott give reasons for wanting it to be extended to 1998? He just believed that the, the date could not be affixed in history. So he just threw it out of the hat, so to speak? Correct. Oh, now, this is, let me let me ask you all, do we have a second witness for the validity of this of 538 being the beginning of the 1260 years? We have it right on the charts here. And I mean, I'm looking at it right now. And of course, I've read read the great, great controversy. So. Uh, how many more witnesses do we need? Okay, well, I'm I'm asking a question. I mean, we've had we've had quite a a little dust up going on, where we have those that believe that Rome establishes the vision. We have those that believe that the army of Rome is a power that is to be addressed. And it's led to a a separation again. So I'm going back to something very basic. Do we have a manner? Do we have a way of showing a second witness to the validity of the dates of 508 and 538 AD? How can we approach this? William Miller's writings. And I mean, I'm not very well informed in all of this, but I'm sure even if you looked at some worldly historians, we'd find, you know, some backup for it. Maybe. Well, you have, uh, yeah, you have uh, like structures as well. You know, have, you have like Joseph being 30 years old, and then Christ being 30 years old. It begins a period of seven years, and that's uh, then followed by another period of seven years, which is divided. And can be divided between two years and five years. Okay. Uh, from when Jacob came down into Egypt. So, therefore, when you apply that in a symbolic way, so in seven years, uh, it's going to be divided up into like 252 years so right. for, for, every, for every one year. So it's a period of 1,764 years. And if you divide that into two periods of 252, and five periods of 252, uh, it's sort of a, you have about 538 being established there as a, a, the, the marker which parallels when uh, Jacob came down into Egypt with his brothers in the mid sort of after two years of the famine. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this publicly. I'm going to say this very directly. I have been greatly blessed by your work on your document, Tabled History. There are multiple things that I have come to understand because of this document, because there are so many truths that I'm finding that were opened within this document that it is something that all of us need to consider and consider directly. Now, in this, we were working through this very limited way on this on the 70 weeks. But in covering the situation with what you had presented in Tabled History, I'm asking a question because I want to see if this following premise would look to be valid. If Rome establishes the vision, 
then historically we should be able to note items that would support our understanding of both 508 and 538 AD. So I'm going to come down here. We're going to talk about 508, and I've said it, I've said it before. I apologize for this being so small. I just don't know how to make this adjustment in the view on this. And we have 538. So consider this for a moment. And here again, I am more than willing to be, I'm more than willing to stand to be corrected. Well, you had the, I'm sorry, Dwight, you had the 1335 in the 1290 that also supports 508, right? Okay. But I'm, I'm looking at something historical because there are those even within Adventism today that are trying to place the 1290 and the 1335 further into the future. Okay, what, yes, what I, because of the 1919 General Conference, that's because of questions on doctrine. And I mean, the group that I'm with now believes believes in that gap theory, like there's a separation of the last seven years. And they believe in Antiochus Epiphanes and all this. And it's really difficult stuff. So this came into the church. The SDA church and has really polluted some minds. Okay. Well, here's, here's part of my reason, my th thinking and why I'm having an issue with the futurists that are making these claims. The work that Brother Stephen did on tabled history opens different aspects for us to consider that many, including Father Miller, had not considered. Now, the understanding that Louis Weir presented in the 1950s that has been accepted that Rome establishes the vision is yet controverted within Adventism, and it's controverted within the movement. Now, we accept that 508 and 538 are important. We accept that just like with Joseph, there had to be a period of 30 years for him to, as it is, be in training before he became the second most powerful man within Egypt. There were 30 years in the life of Christ before he could begin his role similar to a priest within and for us. Would we agree with that? Yes, I would. Okay. Now, mathematically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something, and I'm going to show you my work before I put my premise in place. As we did before, we're going to look at a B.C. date, and we're going to add to this an A.D. date. And I want you to consider what we're going to, what we're going to deal with here. The thought process that I have is that Rome establishes the vision. The thought process that I have is that we should be able to accept from history that Rome establishes the vision, and therefore we should be able to prove it from history. Consider this at this time. Historically, it is stated that Rome was established in 753 B.C., when I place 753 in this regard, and I add this to 508 AD, is this, so I want equals, boom, minus one, plus. It gives me 1,260 years from the founding of Rome to 508 AD. In a similar way, when I go from 753 B.C. to 538 A.D., I come to a period of 1290 years. Yet it's the 1290 that's added to 508 to prove 1798, and it's 1260 that's added to 538 that proves the 1260. Does this premise, 
that from the founding of Rome that we can come 1,260 years to 508 help us in our understanding that this is indeed Rome that is establishing these portions of the vision. I would see it as a support. Okay. From here, as a historical application, we should now be able to build even further upon our understanding of why the 1335 and the seven times are all part and parcel with this. Now, the thing that that also struck me from the founding of Rome to the fall of Samaria, the fall of the northern 10 tribes, we have a period of 30 years. So we have this period of 30 years before Rome begins its ascendancy, and this is pagan Rome, just as we have this period of 30 years between 508 and 538 before papal Rome begins its ascendancy. Uh, just to clarify, it's the captivity of Isaiah in 723 rather yes. than the fall of Samaria. Well, it isn't. It, isn't it the fall of Samaria in 723 BC? You no, know, we understand that it falls in 721. Okay, but 723 is 19 years after the vision of Isaiah that's recorded in Isaiah 7, verse 8, right? Yes, concerning uh, the Lamb being forsaken of both their kings. Okay. Okay, so I made a misapplication. I'm sorry. I stand corrected. That's fine. But I was I was very much struck by this when I'm looking that from the founding of Rome to both 508 and 538, we have these time periods that have become so discussed as being incorrect by people like Prescott. So throughout this, we have another pattern we have a pattern that we can we can look at whether we're talking this in dealing with the seven times of Leviticus 26 or whether we're talking about the 220 followed by the 2300 of Daniel 8. All of these things work in concert to show us the validity of the prophetic numbers. Now, do we have any any other question or comment about what I'm what I'm trying to share here? Is it clear? Okay, sorry that when I when I shift to to look at something from the chat, this automatically just shifts and takes it away from the screen that I was using. So, what what you're saying regarding 30 years old to 50 years, the Levitical priestly functions? What what is your thought here? When you and Stephen were talking about the 30 years starting the priesthood, I just decided to, to look it up. And Numbers 4 has about seven seven verses. They keep telling us that that's the year that the priest started at 30 years old. So, you know, just, I fixated on the 30 years. <laughs> okay. Now, is there anything else that we could, we could address there? I don't know why my computer is doing this. Now, the other part of what we were what we would be looking at as we would consider this further here again you were very direct at the camp meeting this last year Stephen I'll make sure I bring this this document up where we would show specific points of the the balance of this this time period when we have this 434 years in the middle, we would come to a midpoint, and that midpoint would be 191 BC. And the 191 BC has the digits to it of 911. Yet on either side of 191 BC, where Rome defeats Greece at Thermopylae, we have a period of 217 years. Now, in the Millerite time, did 217 
have anything important? Was was there a symbol? Was there a figure? Was there anything about 217 that made sense or that we could recognize within the Millerite time frame? July 21st, 1844, midway between the first day of the first month and the 10th day of the seventh month. And what what did that July 21st of 1844, what did that become recognized as? Well, Samuel Snow recognized it as Midwight through Midnight, and uh, Ellen White referred to it as Midway. Right. So we have Midnight or Midway. But we have two Midnights here. We have Midnight for the Grecian Empire. We have Midnight, the beginning of Midnight, the beginning of this this time of ascendancy for the Roman Empire. Now, throughout this, in this portion, we are establishing that the premises that Smith, Froome, Prescott, Ford, Reed, Anderson, and others had used were incorrect because we are nailing down these points in history to show the validity of the position that had been taken. Now, part of what what I was referring to, especially about this with what Prescott had been stating, came because as I listened again to Dwayne Dewey's presentation on the desolation of Jerusalem, he was pointing out specifically in, in his presentation number six, as to where Prescott had stepped off the platform, where Prescott had become incorrect. Our situation right now, our understanding for what we found on the charts, for what we've been looking at in different positions, needs to be examined to see, do we agree with the way that this is constructed? From the numbers, from the math, that Palmoni has presented, I am finding more and more evidence that the charts and the understandings that we have come to have been correct. But I'm still looking, am I explaining this well? Am I explaining this in a way that others would then also be able to explain it? This is why I'm doing more of an examination of what I have been saying, because I have been questioning what we've been going through on these other documents, because if I'm not explaining things well, how can I expect others to be able to explain them well? And when I'm examining what other people are saying, do I agree with what they're saying or do I have to disagree with what they're saying? So there's going to be a few other items that that I'll look to present tomorrow, especially on how specifically others are looking at where the 2300 days could be placed to see if we could agree or if we would not agree. If their explanations can be grounded in history, if they can be affixed as we are looking to affix these portions of these prophecies. So does anyone have any question or comment about what we've addressed so far today? Yeah, I'd like to look at those transcripts from the 1919 Bible conference. I've never looked them up. Do you have a link for them? or What I'll, what I'll do is I'll send out a link. Uh, the one thing that I learned in order to be able to look at these um, I had to choose the the download button, and normally I try to print these so that I can I can get them in a in a, a little tighter format. But I could not print because the document is huge. We're talking one thousand three hundred plus pages. Oh, oh boy. Okay, yeah, I think you said that before, so we'd have to skim through them and just pick out the highlights, I guess. That that would be my my suggestion. 
but it's it's quite a read. So I'll do what I can to get that out so that everybody can can access this. All right. Any Thank other you. you bet. Any other thoughts or comments at this time? Thank you, Dwight. Okay. So shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we are having to open your word, to study your word, and consider that which you would have us to understand. I thank you for those that have attended this meeting, for those that have contributed. Ask, Father, a blessing upon them, and ask, Father, for your watch, care, and guidance on Theodore as he continues to travel. Help us now, Father. May your will be done throughout this day. Direct us in all things so that we may glorify your name and your character in that which we do. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.